Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald. Good evening, everybody. Well, if you remember, Parliament demanded that Theresa May came back after three working days to tell us where we go from here. Uh, She gave her speech this afternoon to a pretty underwhelmed House of Commons, I would have thought. Let's cross live to Westminster and speak to LBC's political editor, Theo Usherwood. Theo, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. So, a strange speech today. She, I mean, is anything really new developed, in your opinion? Nothing new from the Prime Minister's uh, point of view. If there's a truth to come out of it, it is uh, that she has given up on trying to build a consensus amongst uh, Labour MPs. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, uh, refused to meet her. uh, And the Liberal Democrats and the SNP are not going to be much use to the Prime Minister either. So she's focusing her attention, Nigel, on the DUP and the Tory backbenchers. And this is where... I think if there is any progress, there has actually been some movement. We saw a softening of opinion, a coalescing around this idea that the real problem is the backstop. Nigel Dodds, the leader of the DUP in Westminster, urging the Prime Minister to get back to Brussels to secure a change to the withdrawal agreement. Ditto uh, Boris Johnson, the former Foreign Secretary, and Priti Patel, the former International Development Secretary. And now it is down to Theresa May whether she wants to take the gamble of going back to Brussels and saying uh, to the likes of Jean Claude Juncker and Michel Barnier, you have to reopen the withdrawal agreement, you have to insert some sort of time limit or sunset clause into the withdrawal agreement when it comes to uh, the backstop, or whether she just goes back to Brussels and tries to tinker around the edges. And next week's uh, vote on Theresa May's Plan B, her neutral motion, is going to be critical uh, to see whether actually she could go to back to Brussels with that win under her belt if she decides to try and find a way of putting to a vote the idea of a time limit on the backstop. Yeah, it kind of looks to me like Plan B is a bit like Plan A, really. Uh, but maybe she'll get something on the backstop, because I did notice that the Polish Foreign Minister was suggesting that the British should be helped and that perhaps the backstop should be time-limited. So, is there? I mean, does anybody really think the European Union will give on this? No. The Irish Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney, uh, insisting that Ireland was uh, th- then there's, they're not going to waver uh, on the issue of the backstop. Michel Barnier uh, today saying that he wasn't prepared to reopen uh, the withdrawal agreement. But there is a split within the European Union. You highlight the comments made by uh, the Polish uh, foreign minister yeah. saying that actually it should be limited to five years suggesting that the Irish had completely overplayed their hand uh, and pointing out to the Republic, and it would have gone down very badly in Dublin, that actually they have more to lose uh, by uh, Britain leaving without a deal than the British have to to leaving uh, without Mm. uh, a deal. And that will give uh, some uh, credence to the argument from Boris Johnson, from David Davis and other senior Brexiteers that actually, when we get to the... 59th minute of the 11th hour, the, the, the European Union might be willing uh, to budge on this issue. And did I notice, finally, Theo, did I notice that even Jacob Rees-Mogg has potentially softened his position towards backing a deal from Theresa May? Absolutely. He was seen uh, leaving uh, the chamber this afternoon with the chief whip, Julian Smith, mm-hmm. taking a much more conciliatory tone, uh, both uh, in writing on the, in the weekend uh, in the Mail on Sunday, and then with Nick Ferrari uh, this morning during his fortnightly phone-in um, on LBC, taking a much more conciliatory tone uh, and saying that uh, the issue was uh, the backstop and that if the Prime Minister could secure some meaningful changes around that, then uh, Tory MPs would be willing to come on board. Of course, Mr rees is the chairman of the ERG, um, and and uh, the European Research Group, uh, and carries a huge amount of sway uh, amongst Tory uh, leavers Mm. within the House of Commons. Interesting. Theo, thank you. Well, interesting, isn't it, that the Prime Minister, whatever you think of her, she does just keep on going. Um, And you do begin to get the feeling that there are some who, if she got a change to the backstop, might say, do you know what, even though we hate the rest of it, we might just vote for this. But, of course, the other side, the Vince Cables and others, are pushing very, very hard. They want a second referendum. They want Article 50 to be extended. 
Um, and one of the points I've been making over the course of the last few weeks is that if that happened, we would probably have to fight the European elections. And for the first time today, the Prime Minister accepted that point. All the opposition parties that have engaged so far, and some backbenchers, have expressed their support for a second referendum. I've set out many times my deep concerns about returning to the British people for a second referendum. Our duty is to implement the decision of the first one. I fear a second referendum would set a difficult precedent that could have significant implications for how we handle referendums in this country, not least not least strengthening the hand of those campaigning to break up our United Kingdom. <laughs> it would require an extension of Article 50. It would require an extension of Article 50. We would very likely have to return a new set of MEPs to the European Parliament in May. And I also believe that there has not yet been enough recognition of the way that a second referendum could damage social cohesion by undermining faith in our democracy. So there you are. If Article 50 gets extended, and if there was a second referendum agreed to, we would need to extend Article 50 by, well, at least nine months, but probably more realistically a year. Uh, but we could also find that if in the end Mrs May can't get her deal through, then of course an extension of Article 50 becomes the most likely outcome. If it goes on beyond July, when the new European Parliament seats are taken, we'd have to fight them. So we are, for the first time, discussing the possibility, unbelievable, isn't it, 31 months after we voted to leave the European Union, that we could possibly have to fight the European elections on May the 23rd this year. I want to ask you, would you like to participate in those elections. And if you think, absolutely, this will give me the chance to tell the establishment what I think of the Brexit process, call 0345 973 maybe, uh, you think. Actually, no, this is an outrage. We voted to leave to get rid of MEPs and their chauffeur-driven cars and all the Brussels excess, in which case text to 84850, or maybe you take the view that actually there should be no taxation without representation. We shouldn't be paying over huge amounts of money without having any say. And maybe you think it'd be a good thing if MEPs go back for potentially another five-year term. Wow. If that's how you feel, please tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, Facebookers, you can watch us live and comment there too. I'm up to Wigan to speak to John. John, uh, this idea that we could, if Article 50 is extended, vote in a European election, how do you feel about that? I think it's an absolute disgrace. And now they've got the audacity to call themselves right honourable people. I don't know. We voted for leave, not for stay. We didn't vote for this, that and the other. Now they're on about putting it on, for get rid of, get rid of the... Uh, the leave, get rid of the leave one, it's ridiculous. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they don't end up with, with tens up like the old poll tax riots, because I can see that coming off, there's lots of people talking about that. I know you don't you don't go down that path, No, a lot of people that's very annoyed about this. No, well John, you know, what I would say to you is this, if Brexit does completely get stopped, then I will make sure there is a democratic alternative that people can turn to, so that they don't need to take to the streets, and that's always been my view, that democracy works because it stops us needing to go out um, and do violent things, or, 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 or things that disrupt uh, the life of everybody else. I mean, John... You heard all this talk um, about leaving on no deal and you'll hear crashing out. I mean, are you worried? Are you worried about us leaving with no deal? No, that's what I want. That's what we voted for, isn't it? What it says in Article 50, if we, if we don't come to a, a, a decent yep. deal, yep. Right, then we leave. John, the, and that's what uh, 498 MPs voted for. And I just wonder, very interesting. So last night, John, I don't know whether you saw this, but Sky News last night had a debate up in Leeds. Studio audience, they had a debate, they had a vote at the end, and over 50% of the audience said, we want to leave with no deal. So I'm beginning to get the impression that in the north of England, you're standing your ground on this a lot more than many in London. John, thank you for that reaction. And John does not want to vote in the European elections. We voted to stop that kind of thing. What does Guy in East Ham make of this proposition. Good evening, Guy. Hi, Nigel. Um, we're part of a democratic process, and, and that democratic process means extending Article 50, then we're still part of the European Union. Uh, we still have to have a voice heard in Europe, and maybe the mainstream parties might take it a little bit more seriously and try to 
had inference from the centre as opposed to allowing political parties who have a single agenda to, to drive that forward. I, I mean, I would, I would suggest to you, Guy, that if those European elections did go ahead on May the 23rd, that the beneficiaries would be Eurosceptic parties and perhaps the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, you know, Vince Cable is clear, isn't he? Vince Cable wants yeah. to remain lock, stock and barrel. Um, you, you, you know, Eurosceptic parties would say, no, this is ridiculous, we should leave. I think it, I think it would leave, leave Labour and Tory in a very tough position. How would you feel about it, Nigel? Well, look, I want us to leave, but I think... You're a, no, but you're a current standing MEP. I know, I've been there forever, yeah. Um, I've been and, there and to... Obviously, obviously you, you're invested in your pension that you're going to get from that. Well, if I do. I... Um, Guy, I, I've been there 20 years. I want to leave. Of course I do. You know, wh one of the whole points of the referendum was I wanted to be the turkey voting for Christmas. Guy, if, if those European elections have to be contested, uh, then I intend to contest them. Um, because I think it's a chance to send a message to the establishment about the way they've handled Brexit, uh, and, and frankly, uh, the political class trying to betray the will of the people. So I would see it um, as an opportunity in that sense. I also think it's, it's an opportunity um, for, for people to see that actually we do have an input in what the European Parliament do. We do have an input in how we go about business and about reflecting ourselves in the best way possible as opposed to coming across as some um, third world nation with this singular approach. To oh what no, we want no, to do. no, no, guy! There are, uh, you know, there are two hundred countries in the world uh, that are independent, self-governing nations that make their own laws, and many of them are great countries. Uh, all I would say to you, guy, is the argument about input, the argument about influence. We debated that in the referendum, and and my view would be rather than having some input into EU law, I'd rather we made our own. Guy, thank you for your call. Um, it's now quarter past six and it's time. Mrs May accepts that if we extend Article 50, we will probably be contesting the European elections on May the 23rd this year. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's an outrage or is it actually going to be necessary? Before I get to that, overnight, uh, an act of vandalism uh, to the RAF Bomber Command Memorial in Green Park and also the statues of Roosevelt and Churchill sitting on a bench uh, in central London in Mayfair. White paint thrown over both of them. Uh, just an absolute outrage. And, you know, if it wasn't for the 56,000 people that gave their lives in Bomber Command, and if it wasn't for Churchill and Roosevelt, I tell you what, whoever you are conducting these protests, you wouldn't be able to, because you wouldn't be living in a free country. I really, really hope these people get caught by CCTV, and I really hope they go to prison for a long time. I'm not confident that'll happen, but that is how I feel on that subject. So, European elections. Tony and Bracknell, should we contest these elections, or is it an absolute disgrace to be even discussing it? Good evening, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you, finally. Pleasure to speak to you. So, Tony, that's oh, what I the Prime could... Minister said. I mean, what do you think? I think it's an absolute joke. It's just heel dragging yet again. Well, she did but say she did say she didn't want it to happen because she wanted her deal to go through. But she's going to have to make some quite big changes, Tony, to reverse <laughs> her loss of two hundred and thirty, isn't she? The thing is, she won't she won't make any changes. She's not strong enough. She's weak. So you what? Know, so, she's, so she's a poker player that hasn't got a face. Well, that, a, a lot of people have used the poker analogy and just how badly we've played our hand. Tony, I mean, I, do you think that an extension of Article 50 is increasingly becoming likely? Unfortunately, yes. Mm, mm, mm. Because they don't, they don't want to move forward. We, you know, we could tell to the EU all the time we've just become so weak that they're just used to it, they're just pulling this apart. But I've got something I would like to ask you Go on. personally, Nigel. Go on. If the votes, the EU votes have to come up again, will you stand? Yep, you bet your life I will. Absolutely. Right. I, 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 Tony, I would see it as my duty. 
you know, I, I, I think I would have no choice but to throw myself into it. Um, and I, I think if we get to that, the question is, would people be so outraged they'd stay at home or would they come out and support a campaign that I'm trying to lead? And that, of course, is a long way in the distance. Tony, thank you. Lots and lots of messages. Uh, Mrs. Stead in Jarrow says, no extension of Article 50. I know even more since the 2016 referendum and I want to leave on the 29th of March. Barry from Leeds says, why does nobody ask what would be rem- be remaining in? The EU is a complete basket case. Well, Barry, I don't disagree with you. Uh, but this sort of, those messages, continuing with my theme, that the real resistance to all of this seems to be coming very much in the north of England. Uh, Dana is a new caller from Tunbridge Wells. Good Evening to you. Oh, hi, Nigel. I'm on. I sent you an email yesterday about Martin Selmayer, but that's another joke. I, do you know what? I don't I, want Article I, 50. I did have a few extended. emails yesterday, but I will get yeah, to it, I, I don't promise want you. Article 50 to be extended. Right. But what I want to ask you, I know it's deviating from what you're talking about. That's very naughty of if, you, but go on. If the end, Theresa May gets her deal through, which yes. I doubt she will, it's still going to be blocked by John Gal- Burkow. So I don't understand, how does John Burko have well, so much power to be able to do this, Nigel? John Burko can fiddle around uh, with the deal and he can put more power in the hands of MPs and committees. Uh, but ultimately, if the House of Commons was to vote for a Mrs May deal, uh, there's nothing John Burko could do about that. Uh, if we get to that situation, then the deal then goes for the final, final vote and that would be in the European Parliament. And so I'm guessing... Uh, you know, the March session of the European Parliament would be the final, final vote. But let me ask you, you know, if if we finished up with Article 50 being suspended, would you vote in those European elections or would you boycott them as a protest? I'd boycott them with a protest. I'll go on the march in London with you. And the last thing I must say, Nigel, when you open Pandora's box at the very beginning of this, mm. I still don't understand with all the bonuses, all the wages the EU leaders get is absolutely outrageous, funded by the taxpayers, yep. and also the Northern Ireland is a fudge, and it's been a stitch-up from the very beginning by Barnier, the Sinn Féin, and Veradka of Ireland. OK? Yep, they've taken a hell of a risk with their own future, the Irish, but that's what they've done. Dana, thank you very much indeed for your call. Mick in Chesterfield says we should have the European elections in case we get railroaded into remaining, which I wouldn't rule out. And that's the argument, of course, that why would you want to pay £39 billion or whatever it would be and not have at least some kind of a voice uh, in, the, in the European Union? And I do understand the logic of that, even though I don't really like it. Ollie in Basingstoke is taking a much tougher line. Let's just get out of Europe and disconnect all unnecessary ties. These elections are a waste of time and money, both of which we don't have right now. Well, lots and lots of you feeling very, very strongly about this. It's absolutely disgraceful. May should have gone. We voted to leave over two years ago. They are making a joke out of us. No EU elections. No deal, says Shirley. So, you know, passions are very, very strong on this. But I'm keen. You know, tell me if you think it really, really is a good idea. Oh three four five six six oh six oh nine seven three. Simon is a new caller from Maidstone in Kent. Good evening, Simon. Good evening, Nigel. <clears throat> I've got a very simple point, which is if there is going to be a set of elections, the best thing to do is contest the elections. Right. Let's get leave people into the European Parliament, team up with the Hungarians, team up with the Italians, team up with all the anti-EU MEPs that are coming after the LFS protests and start tearing down this structure from the inside. Use democracy against them. Because that's the it's best a very, thing to do. very interesting argument, Simon. And I can tell you that one thing for certain is that the current European Commission and the the bosses of the European Parliament are already very scared of these European elections because they are likely to produce the biggest number of Eurosceptics ever been seen in the European Parliament. I would expect myself, even without the UK, something like a hundred and seventy to 180 MEPs to get elected who are really strongly against centralised Brussels control. If you added the Brits to that, it would probably be well over 200. So, so Simon, there is, you know, I mean, you mentioned the Hungarians. You know, Orban's argument is um, that he wants to try to change it from within. And someone once said 
that years ago we used to say Nigel Farage was the worst nightmare of the European Union because he wanted to leave it. Now some say Viktor Orban is an even bigger nightmare of the European Union because he wants to stay. So there are some people trying to disrupt it from within. Uh, no, thank you very much indeed for your point of view. Mark is calling from Belfast. Good evening, Mark. Yes, good evening, Nigel. Uh, an actual fact, the worst nightmare for the EU is Italy. OK, Italy is the key. OK, it's one of the largest contributors to the EU right now. Yep. It's my firm belief that the five-star La Liga coalition uh, when they're uh, elected in May, as the polls would suggest, yes. will pull the plug on any uh, such, uh, future contributions to the EU. At that point, it's game over. It's very interesting, Mark. That I mean, those parties, you know, Five Star, a really very new party, you know, set up about seven or eight years ago by Italy's most famous stand-up comedian, Beppe Grillo, uh, the Lega, who've been around for 30, 40 years, but been rejuvenated uh, by this character, Matteo Salvini. Uh, and there they are in coalition, running the country, uh, their current poll ratings and approval ratings are round about, just over, in fact, 60%. Uh, and they're arguably the most popular Italian government that we've seen in modern living memory. So, Mark, I'm with you. I think the odds are that those parties are going to storm to a dramatic victory in May in the European elections. And, yeah, in many ways, they do hold the key. But whatever they do with the European Union or not, you know, would you think it right that the UK contests those elections? No, there's really no need, Nigel. There's really no need. I, I think all the populist parties across the board, uh, Vox in Spain, uh, Le Pen's uh, National, um, National Rally mm -hmm. uh, Party, etc., uh, etc., et they're going to pull the plug on the funding. When the, once the funding goes, there goes the EU. OK, Mark, well, we'll wait and see. Thank you. Chris, there's a new caller from Bristol. Good evening, Chris. Hello, Nigel. Welcome. So, should we fight these European elections, or would, it, or would it just highlight the extent to which our politicians had failed to deliver on the referendum? It, that's exactly right. I mean, our seats have already been given away in the European Parliament, so I don't see how we can even do it. Well, here's the point. OK, Chris, good point. The seats have been reallocated, OK? But the European treaties are perfectly clear that if you're a member of the European Union, you can test the elections and you send representatives to Strasbourg and Brussels. So what they're talking about, if they have to change their minds, is maybe paying financial compensation to the countries that have previously, previously been promised. Chris, it, you know... It could be done, and if they tried to stop us from standing, my guess is there'd be a legal challenge to the European Court of Justice. So I think the reality is that if Article 50 gets extended by a year, uh, during which time we, we, we try and get a new deal, or during which time the House of Commons pushes for a second referendum, I think it's pretty unavoidable we'd fight those elections. I think this Article 50 extending is just the Ramoners just trying to kick the can down the road. It's like, yeah, extend it, extend it, mm. have another referendum, make it even, even... I don't think they'll even believe they can win a second referendum, but they know if they will win it, then it means that it will kick things down the road, and then after they've lost the second referendum, they will want to find oh. some reason to oh, kick don't. it down the road further and don't, further and Don't, don't, Chris. Enough, enough, enough. You're depressing me. Thank you. It's 6.30. So, a concession from Mrs May. She's dropping the post-Brexit £65 fee for EU citizens. So the idea was, if you apply for settled status in the United Kingdom, and perhaps after that leading on maybe to applying for citizenship, you'd have to put up you'd have to put up £65. And Mrs May today has said she's scrapping that. And that's all part of her attempt to try and get cross-party support for, well, I say her Brexit deal, whatever Brexit deal she finishes up coming back with. Although I did rather notice today that Plan B did look a little bit like Plan A. But another story that struck me, and I, and I, and I really rather liked, you know all this project fear that Brits living in Europe may not be able to stay, that we might even find it difficult to go on holiday there, that the whole thing would be awful. Well, let me tell you that the very sensible Portuguese government have said they unilaterally are guaranteeing rights for all UK citizens living in Portugal. They have said that even in the event of a no-deal Brexit, there'll be no visas required to go to Portugal. But the best of the lot, the top of the pops, is they're going to introduce a British tourists-only 
fast track lane at Faro Airport. How about that? Why? Because, as we've argued time and time again, the Brits pour huge amounts of money into these Mediterranean countries and particularly into Portugal. Um, and they're grown up, they're sensible, they recognise that. So all these scare stories that we won't be able to go anywhere in the future, proving again and again to be total and utter nonsense. But Stephen feels strongly about it on Facebook and says she is betraying the Brexit leave by scrapping the £65 fee and bowing to EU demands. And Stephen, I get your point, because actually it seems to me that 65 quid is not a lot of money to pay to live in what I think we still believe is the best country in the world. Not a lot really, is it, 65 quid? But hey, she's desperate to get support from wherever she can find it in the House of Commons. Uh, and money, big, big theme. Um, Shazwellin says to me on Facebook, how to weaken our hand in negotiations? Tell the EU they will get 39 billion, whether there's a deal or no deal. Well, actually, she hasn't said that. And one of the benefits of the so-called no deal is we wouldn't have to pay the 39 billion, but then again... With Theresa as Prime Minister, we probably would. If Nigel F. took part in the EU elections, we would have Barnier shouting, there's a Farage in every town, Colin from Stockton on Tees. Barnier did say a few months ago, one of the problems we have in Europe is there's now a Farage in every country. It's like the bogeyman, isn't it? This horrible, terrible figure. Uh, it, like a, sort of a, a rash that is now sweeping across Europe. Let's go to Dale in Chester. Good evening, Dale. Hi, Nigel. You OK? I'm OK. So, Dale, I've been warning about this for some time. The Prime Minister today's well, confirmed it. I mean, would you take part in those elections or would you see it as no. a disgrace? If, if you were running, then probably yes. But I just want to say, we've been railroaded for two years now. She, she's gone to the EU with a cap in hand. We're not going to get a deal. We, it's never going to happen. We should, we should just leave and get out. We're going to have to pay £39 billion to the EU for the privilege of staying in. That's what's going to happen. And, and it's terrible. Do you know what Juncker said about a year ago? He made a statement and he said, uh, thanks for the war, Britain, but now you've got to pay. Well, he's right, because now we are going to have to pay £39 billion of taxpayers' money to stay in the EU. I think it's disgusting. Theresa May needs to grow a backbone and get us out. No deal. She even said it. Either you accept wow. my deal or it's no deal. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, she did. I mean, I, mean, no I mean, to be fair, Dale, she did not today weaken and surrender on the no deal uh, principle but she did say it wasn't her desired choice but if you accept her deal you can avoid no deal but she didn't she hasn't taken it off the table which apparently is what mr corbyn wants her to do but i mean surely surely that corbyn approach means they could just walk all over us well corbyn corbyn that's the that's the threat corbyn <laughs> that's the biggest thing but look she's lost all credibility now within the eu within within the parliament I, I, there's no place for it we need a leader, we need someone to but, take us out of the but, EU but Dale, and take control back. But Dale, you know, she's won a motion of confidence in the House of Commons and she's won it within her own party. She's there for at least another 11 months, isn't she? Well, we can't do anything about that. We're <laughs> stuffed. We're stuffed. We're stuffed. What do we do? Well, I, t I tell you what we can do in one way. Look on in wonderment at how this woman, and I disagree with almost everything she's done, but I've got, got to give her credit, Dale. She's got stickability, hasn't she? Oh, she's stuck. She's stuck to it. Yeah, you know, she's she's tenacious. I'll give her that. But she's not representing the people. When we took that vote, it was very clear. There was there was two questions: Do we stay in or do we go no, out? Well, I don't disagree. It wasn't. With it wasn't. Do we go out with a deal? I know. I know. The, the, and, I know. I know. And, and then what frustrates me more than anything is all these pol all these um, politicians are telling me what mm. I voted for, mm. and mm. I didn't. Mm. I voted to go. I don't want a deal. I just want to go. Well, do you know what, Dale? The clue was when she went and spoke in Florence and said, we want a deep and special partnership with the European Union. And I thought to myself, I did not vote for that. But hey, Dale, I thank you. Uh, Dale, pretty upset with the whole shooting match. Felix is calling from Sutton. Felix, are you one that thinks we should contest these European elections? Um, I think if Article 50 is extended, then we most definitely need to be running in the European elections because we also need to have a voice there um, and to make sure that um, citizens here in the UK are, are fairly represented. But I wanted to put a question to you specifically on, do, do, do you think that Brexiteers and those that voted leave all voted leave for different reasons? 
Uh, do I think people that voted Remain did so for different reasons? Yes, I do. Correct. Um, Correct. I mean, what, you know, what, you think, what, what worried about their mortgages now? and Project Fear? Look, Felix, you know, there are, amongst the Leave vote, there were different salient reasons, weren't there? I mean, for many people, it was getting back control of our borders. They saw this massive population increase that had taken place in the previous 15 years as being unsustainable. So that was one reason. But ultimately, ultimately, even immigration is just a subset, isn't it? of the overall point about governing your own country, making your own decisions, being a proper nation. And that, I think, Felix, united nearly all, virtually all, Leave voters. Well, what I, was, what I wanted to say is that there are so many different reasons why people voted in the referendum, and that we're now at a stage where the government has, has barely respected the result of, of the likes of yourself who voted for, for numerous different reasons, and, and for the reasons that a lot, of, a lot of Remainers voted for. So don't you think now it's time to actually go back to the people and get their reassurance on what it is they previously voted for, and to make sure that the government have the backing of the people in going forward with whatever future prospect it is that's going to be set question, out for but, us. But what question, Felix, would you ask them? Well, I think it, it would be, well, for, for me personally, I would like to see leave, remain, and then the government... Well, hang on, on hang, no, 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 hang on, Felix. You can't have remain. We've already, vo- we've already voted to leave. And, 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 and we voted, and, and we voted for it once, and then we voted for it in the general election when the two big, when the two big parties. To, and then, and then, hang, hang, on, hang, on, hang on, hang on a second. And then 498 members of parliament voted for Article 50. So at every level... But the, but the, but the MPs don't represent the general population as a I whole. know, I couldn't the agree end, more, end, absolutely. And at the end of the day, and that's why, and that's why we need a people's vote. And even you, oh. Bill, on, on Politics Live, on Politics Live, you even, you even sat in front of Alistair Campbell, and you were quite open to the idea of a referendum, and you were quite up to it, and, you, and even you said that you would run in, you would, that you would campaign in, in Felix, another referendum. Felix, Felix, I'm not open to it, but I accept that if it comes, we have to fight it. You can't run away from it. If it, it you can't run away from it if it happens. But I do think it'd be quite wrong for remain to be on the ballot paper and certainly a sort of multiple choice of a three i think would be absolutely wrong felix i thank you very much for your call nigel it's not about 65 pounds you should multiply that by millions of european citizens living in this country that comes to many millions i don't think the europeans will be as generous to us says alan in whitstable alan you know 65 quid i don't know i mean, I, I wonder if you put a scheme like, like that into place how much administrative cost there is and how much of that £65 would actually be net profit. Probably not all that much. Hi, Nigel. Good old Portugal. They are our oldest and longest ally. Sure, they are. And also the first to back us in the Falklands campaign, says Kev from Gillingham. And yeah, have to say, love the Portuguese, love Portugal. Um, And the idea now... There's going to be a fast track Brits only queue. Well, I tell you what, I can't wait to book some tickets because it's a simply great place to go. The time is now 6.45. And it's, well, I don't know, the thought of contesting the European elections if Article 50 gets extended is getting some of you very, very excited indeed. But Jan from Swansea says, well, Barnier will agree to anything to stop you getting back into the EU Parliament. It's an excellent negotiating hand. Well, it's back to the bogeyman, isn't it? Give us something on the backstop. Or you get that Farage bloke back. And actually, Guy Hofstadt last week said he wanted Britain to remain, but he didn't want me to go back there. So maybe, Jan, you got a point. Now, Darren takes a different view on the 65 quid. He says, why should people have to pay for settled status? After five years, surely it should be our privilege to give them settled status. No, Darren, I don't agree at all. Surely it's their privilege to come and live here. And we should feel a bit prouder about who we are as a nation and what that represents. That's my view. Lynn says, caller makes a great point. Why are we paying £39 billion to the EU and yet at the same time wavering a paltry 65 quid for people who want to come and live here? Ian is firm. No extension. WTO now. Well, look, a, quite a big majority of you tonight that have called in and texted and tweeted are saying that actually you think it would be an outrage to fight these European elections. Please, if somebody's really enthusiastic about being represented in the European Parliament, do call 0345 6060 973. I'm up to Manchester to speak to Lewis, who's a new caller to the show. Good evening, Lewis. Uh, Hello, Nigel. Can you hear me? I can, and welcome. Oh, thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to say that I I voted uh, Remain first time round uh, because I thought that was the best thing to do. 
but I could have very easily voted leave. So I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. Uh-huh. And I, th- I think um, if we had one more vote, vote like a people's vote, and, and, you know, and everyone to can sort of like bring forward their, their arguments one final time, and we can contest the European elections, I think that would be good for everyone because at least that way uh, the, the, the population has all the, the relevant information. We've, we've watched Brexit in, the, in, two, in two years. So I think a people's vote is, is the best oh, dear, thing. Oh, dear, dear, Lewis we, uh, had the, Lewis, we had the people's vote and we were told by everybody that it was our decision and that our government and parliament would abide by the result. To make them vote again, Lewis, would be a catastrophic breach of trust in the whole democratic process. But isn't it more democratic to get the, the population to have a, a second view? To, to maybe well, why not a third? It? Why not a third? Why not a third referendum and a fourth referendum and keep on going until the big banks and big businesses win? Is that what you mean? No, no. What, what we should do is we should stipulate what this referendum should be about. So we will stipulate and say things like it, it has to be a majority of 60% regardless. And if it goes uh, 55, 45 or anything like that, then we, we go back to the first referendum. So it would so need we, to be 60% to reverse the result of the first referendum. Is that what you're suggesting? If, if the population changes their mind, yes. Well, Lewis, I think there's great danger uh, in pushing for a second referendum. Great danger to the, de- to the whole democratic integrity of this country. I think it was pretty clear first time round. The other point, Lewis, I'd make to you is this. That uh, YouGov polling out last week, giving people the options, leave with no deal, leave with May's deal, renegotiate, uh, remain... Or have, or have a second referendum. When people were given that menu to choose from, only 8% chose a second referendum. So there is no great public support for this, Lewis. People don't want it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think it would be best for the country. And, and plus, w- w- what, what are you afraid of? That people change their minds? I'm afraid, the- I'm, I'm afraid that this country uh, that used to sort of believe uh, that it was the foundation of democratic self-government upon mu- of which much of the world based itself, um, I'm, I'm worried about that. I really am. Anyway, Lewis, I thank you. Now, earlier on this morning, you might have heard Jacob Rees-Mogg on with Nick Ferrari. And really unusually... He had a question he couldn't answer. Jamie is in Nottingham. Jamie, you're on the radio. Good morning. Morning, chaps. Morning, Jamie. If you were leading the Conservative Party, would you let Nigel Farage in? Oh, goodness, that's a really difficult question. You've got to ask... That's one of the few times I've seen Jacob Rees-Mogg actually draw breath. Normally he's pretty good, he's on the money. Well done, Jamie. That was a real googly. Indeed it was, I wasn't expecting that. Um, And the answer? uh, And the answer is, I suppose, would Nigel want to join? Never mind that, what would you do? Look, I, I think if the Conservative Party could reunite with the reasonable elements of UKIP, that would be very good news and Nigel would be part of that. I think the problem at the moment is that UKIP, with its links now to Tommy Robinson, has become... Which Nigel Farage which is Nigel totally opposed left. to. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so I think it would be much easier now than it would have been when he was still a member of UKIP. It may be a little bit early, though personally I hold Nigel in the highest regard and think he was one of the people who was instrumental in delivering... Brexit. He was in trouble there, wasn't he? I have to say, I would not want to join a Conservative Party that had people like Philip Hammond in it and David Liddington in it, uh, let alone uh, the Anna Subris of this world. But of course, truth is, they wouldn't have me anyway. But I thought a very entertaining start to the day on LBC there with Nick Ferrari. Neil says, you will get your second referendum in 25 years or so once we've given Brexit a fair chance. And Neil, you know, I do feel to have another referendum before you've enacted the first one, would just be wrong. Um, Howard says, not a bad thing if MEPs change parties or go independent after you voted for them. Well, uh, Howard, it's never good when that happens, but it does happen sometimes, and sometimes for very good reasons. Jackie says, we could all boycott uh, the European elections. Well, look... I think if we have these European elections, many people may boycott them. I don't know, but should we be having them at all? Dave is a new caller from Islington. Good evening, Dave. Uh, good evening, Nigel. I'd just like to bring up, bring up really, to uh, voice my opinion against these Remainers. Who right. keep saying we should have another uh, referendum. Uh-huh. I would like to remind these people that this is the second one. We had one way, way back, many years ago, 
with Ted Heath, bless his soul. And we went to go into the common market for a very, very small majority. Now, I was well. not very pleased about that result. But I didn't throw my p- toys out the pram like this mob are doing at this present moment. They all will grow up and accept defeat yeah. gracefully. I mean, Dave, there is a difference in that that referendum, of course, wasn't to join the EEC. They, I mean, Parliament just signed us up without asking us. That referendum was about whether we stay in, and it was a clear margin in favour that time round. But, Dave, I understand your frustration, and I sense there are millions, millions out there feeling uh, uh, you know, as angry and upset as Dave from Islington is. I've got time for one last caller. Peter is calling from Maidenhead. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Nigel. Nice to talk to you. Good to talk to you. So, does it make sense? Does it make sense if Article 50 is extended to accept we've got to fight these European elections? I think you absolutely must, for a number of reasons. I'm a constituent of um, Theresa May, yeah? Uh-huh. Trying to get through to her, I could have stopped her making huge classic mistakes, yeah? But it's impossible. She has a team around her who just isolate her. This team is mad. How would you possibly negotiate a divorce fee without negotiating a trade agreement. You must be mental. Well, it's an absolutely yeah? ridiculous thing to do. I agree with that. I spent 25 years big ticket selling, yeah? Mm-hmm. That's just insanity, mm-hmm. yeah? So, the next thing is, if you're there, you can ask questions like, why do you want the backstop? You say it won't happen, and if it happens, only for a very short time. So, therefore, it's not really important to, is it? Unless it's a ruse. The next thing I would do is I would expose who wants the backstop. That's that dumb Irish Prime Minister. Well, some people think he's rather smart, Peter, but we've all got our points of view. He's certainly obsessed with the EU. I mean, Peter, are you saying that actually, in the absence of a deal being agreed, it might be quite useful to have MEPs going back to Brussels? Absolutely essential, because, look... He's insisting on a backstop, so the European partners are supporting him. We will never agree with that. Hey, we've got tried to get rid of our Prime Minister. She's had the biggest defeat ever since Parliament started. Mm-hmm. I think that sends a clear message. The Brits will never accept that. You know, well, how would the Germans like to annex Peter, Bavaria? All I can tell you, Peter, is if we do fight those European elections, I think there'll be a lot... Uh, of Eurosceptic MEPs that go back and join up with other, other MEPs around Europe of a similar point of view. A long way to go yet, though. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'll be back tomorrow night here in London at 6. At 10 tonight, it's Tom Swarbrick. But up next, it's Ian Dale.